there weren't that many third-party integrations simply because everybody was doing everything themselves. Um, how many of you guys actually work at Intercom? Since we're having it hosted here. Okay. So uh, at least one. I had a really cool talk about Intercom that talked about a simple, similar trajectory about online chat, how in the beginning a lot of people were developing chat solutions themselves and kind of hacking at it. Um, and then the market started to be really about that. So same thing with third-party integrations for authentication and uh, purchases and stuff like that. Uh, there weren't none. Everybody was just developing their own bespoke solutions. Um, but when you fast forward to 2019, um, how many of you guys have used Sentry.io before? Okay. Um, how many of you guys have used Auth0 for authentication? Slightly more. So now there's kind of an API for everything. So in the bad old days, um, if you were doing error tracking at all, you were doing it with your old solution, you had to write almost all of your own authentication. And now eBay, in addition to having like a new logo, which is pretty cool, uh, has, I think, something like 10 developer APIs um, for doing all sorts of stuff from monitoring your purchases to making them once, to stuff like that. So uh, the economy between um, uh, the Clinton days and I guess the Trump days uh, uh, 24 years later is uh, quite different. And so it's moving from a, um, a non-API at all economy to almost an API first, uh, API consumer driven economy. So, uh, why do we test things in general before we get to why do we test API? So, how many of you guys have seen this meme before? It's my favorite meme about testing. So, uh, I'll start at the top. Oh no, the robots are killing us, which is of course bad, um, unless you're into that sort of thing. And then, but why? We never program them to do this. Uh, and then for those of you who are C programmers, you'll get it maybe more than others. So, is crazy murdering robot equals false? Interact with humans if crazy murdering robot equals true, kill humans. Uh, so basically, that winds up being an assignment statement instead of a Boolean statement, and then the robots wipe out, wipe out humanity. So that's why we test things. Um, uh, and then what we test these days, and this is kind of uh, the main subject of the presentation. So our functions are looking more and more like this um, uh, all the time. So uh, for example, this is a function of Python, but we'll say, for example, that we want to get somebody's GitHub info. <coughs> Um, and then within the function, we'll just make a lot of fetches to like HubSpot and then Stripe and then SendGrid and then maybe a few other services. So we're testing more and more functions that are integrated with uh, third-party uh, services, which makes it really hard uh, to test them because we don't have control over our own code. So now I want to talk about what these third-party services are or what these APIs, application programming interfaces are before I talk about how to test them in Node. So uh, if you want to check out the world's most popular APIs, um, you can just go on programmableweb.com. It has a great uh, index of, I think, over 20,000 yeah, 20, APIs and counting. Um, but even though there's lots of APIs from uh, Amazon to Azure to Intercom, which has one to, to Zoom, um, there's not a lot of great testing solutions for them. But I've seen a lot of bad testing solutions. So bad option one is do nothing. Uh, so this is a quite uh, common pattern, which is not bad necessarily. How many of you guys have ever done that before? That there's a test that's just too annoying and you just disable it and then just move on? Yeah, people are going like this, but it's okay, like loud and proud. All right, thank you. I've done it. Uh, so, yeah, you write a test and then it, you know, fails for whatever reason, maybe because it's making an API call and you do nothing. Um, yeah. Or it takes too long. Or it takes too long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, caching, but yeah. Um, so, bad option two for third-party integrations is to use the real API. So um, one thing I was saying to a couple people up here is I've actually, because, since we released this open source library, I've been on a small tour of giving these meetups and I always ask for funny stories about how many people have screwed something up using a real API from a test. Does anybody have a story like, okay, you. So I might add you to this slide uh, later. We can have a chat about that. Um, but these are real stories that I picked up on the road. This is my favorite one, which actually came from the first meetup I gave about this. Uh, I want you back. So. A company accidentally embedded a Twilio API key in their continuous integration <coughs> environment, sending a text message tens of times a day to a person in Kansas saying, I want you back with a little heart afterwards, <laughs> which is, you know, that's nice, um, but uh, it could be a lot worse than that. So, um, yeah, this one. So a company uh, was not testing um, the JSON that was coming in from an API, uh, and they were storing all the JSON in a MongoDB uh, uh, cluster. So they kept pinging an API um, that kept returning error, no such user, because the API was malformed, except they weren't testing it. So they just stored error, non -such user, no such user, as like 10,000 MongoDB documents. 
And then when they opened it up to do analytics on their user base, they saw that their user base was extremely homogeneous. They all had one quality called no such user. So, and that was going on for months before somebody actually like turned on the analytics software. So you see stuff like this happening actually all the time uh, when people use uh, real APIs or variations thereof in their testing. Um, bad option three, uh, which I see less often, but like I've definitely heard of, is reverse engineering the APIs in your test code. How many of you guys have accidentally found yourself implementing logic of a third party API before? I see like at least five people raising hands. So it's like, you know the API does something under the hood, you kind of need to emulate it in order to be able to test it. Um, and instead of calling the real thing, you just innocently like add maybe a Boolean clause and then a small file and pretty soon you've accidentally reverse engineer the Facebook API just to test like the user's endpoint or something like that. So it can get out of hand pretty quick um, when you're doing that sort of thing. So there's many ways uh, in order to uh, get around this and I'd like to present you two competing uh, alternatives for how to do it. Uh, in full disclosure, um, so they're both open source projects, but in full disclosure, uh, we developed the second one. Um, so of course we're quite attached to it and we developed it a little bit in response to this, but that said, um, there is a uh, significant overlap, but there's also a big difference between the two, so um, it's not at all one size fits all. So uh, this is called NOC. How, how many of you guys have used NOC before for API testing? Okay, a couple of you guys. Um, so I'll just go through a simple code base that uses NOC. So let me just run the tests. So this is a um, there you go. So you see that like no tricks up my sleeve. All of these tests pass, but what are they? Uh, yeah. So this is the uh, repository, and the basic idea of knock. Let me make it a little bit bigger because this is like prohibitively uh, difficult to read. I must say. And this is getting really to like the meat of uh, the the meetup, so feel free even to like copy these down or just take notes on these patterns. Um, uh, so this is using Jest. Uh, a lot of people use Mocha or Tape as well, and it'll work in all three of them. Um, they're all great, uh, or Jasmine, uh, whatever you'd like, but they all work. So um, the uh, before each, you tell Knock that if you are calling um, this endpoint, then, uh, actually, this is a bad example, let's do something a little bit, um, a little bit easier, yep, GitHub API. So if you're calling this endpoint, get Adam slash license, then reply 200 with this information uh, in the background. And then whenever there's a call, like using Axios or Fetch or something like that, to GitHub, it will substitute in this information. So you can imagine that if you're building an application with a lot of third-party integrations, um, as long as you know what those integrations are, it's really easy to fill in uh, the type of mock data that you want um, and have it served back to you. And you can do it with different types of requests. So uh, let me just, again, stay here for a second to show um, how it's imported. So you import knock into your test. Um, how many of you guys are using ES6 syntax like this, actually? Because it might not be, okay. So most of you guys, if it's foreign to you, just feel free to talk to me after the meetup, um, but it's, this is TypeScript, ES6 syntax. So before each, you define um, what you're going to mock in knock, how you're going to mock it, and then knock will take care of it. Note that knock will only take care of it once, which means that um, if you, uh, I think that's, yeah, that's the way the new version works, that if you call this twice, it will only return uh, this once and the second one will hit the real API. So this is just useful to, useful to know. Um, there you go. So now moving on to a slightly more complicated example. So here we have a post request and it's posting with a username and a password. Um, and same exact thing, when we call that post request with login, under the hood <coughs> automatically, this uh, reply will just be substituted in. And then we could just check, for example, that the ID is the thing that we said it would be. So uh, you, you can just consider knock kind of a declarative fake version of the implement of internet for all of your tests. Um, can any of you guys spot, seeing the pattern, some difficulties that would come up with using knock if you're working on, let's say, a larger code base? Or have you run into any for those of you who raised your hand and said you were using it? Yeah. When the APIs change, you have to keep your responses up to date? Yeah. Um, 
and not only when APIs change, but even uh, if you're using the API for the first time and you don't know it off the top of your head, you need to like find the documentation or, or something like that. Um, so that could be a, a, a big hassle. And yeah, there's no, no way to update that, so absolutely. Um, something else, like let's say the application's really big, um, like hundreds of API calls in one path. Does so anybody see any like other uh, issues that can come up with Knock? This isn't one that I've personally run to myself, but um, Knock, like I said, it will only mock a single endpoint once. So uh, if your function has like a hundred different calls to a hundred different APIs and is aggregating them all the time, like asynchronously or something like that, you need to write mock data for all of those, which is just really time consuming and takes a lot of like research and, um, and time to develop. And then the other problem with that is that if you change the test to point to a different endpoint, like knock is really sensitive. So if you have example.com slash foo, uh, it won't work, or slash foo with a query parameter it won't work. So it matches everything exactly. And it's pretty finicky if you change stuff. So that could be another problem that comes up uh, when using knock. But that said, for really quick tests, like you see here, it's it's quite useful. So going back to the presentation, that's knock. Uh, if you want to clone that repo that we made, um, you can go here, github.com slash mishkin slash sfnode dash knock. And we did it um, just as kind of a hello world thing. It's pretty comprehensive, so it'll show you more or less everything that uh, one can do with, with knock. Um, and it is quite a useful tool. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about uh, is unmock, which does it the exact opposite way. So instead of defining um, the API call that you're going to make and then making it, unmock, you run the test until it fails, then it creates a shell for the API call and lets you fill it in and gives you different strategies to fill it in. So again, if we're thinking about it conceptually as two different ways, uh, knock, you have to declaratively say, I'm going to call GitHub, I'm going to call intercom, I'm going to call Slack or whatever and say exactly what it's going to be. Um, fill it in and then let it work, whereas unmock, you just you don't say you're going to call anything. You just let it run, and it will create empty or full, depending on the rules, JSON objects as soon as it hits a call to an external API. So you kind of fail your way to success, and basically you run the test like several times. You fail, 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 and then ultimately it succeeds once you've mocked out everything. Um, so to show, uh, well, I'll get to how we do it in a second. Um, but if you guys want to pull this, um, this uses Next.js. How many of you guys are developing with Next.js? Okay, so several of you. So because it's Next, it's hybrid, um, and it has some JS DOM stuff, but we'll focus on the Node JS stuff for now. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Um, yeah, I only had a third hand. Uh, let me start a Next server, um, if I have one, one second. Sure. No. Okay. Yep. That's it. Um, so I'm going to use a token uh, just for um, remote storage. That's the token thing, but you don't need that uh, at all. Um, you can just run Neon Dev, and it'll work just fine. So let me take you guys to the code base for that one and show how it works and how it's a little bit different um, and kind of what purpose it serves. So as you saw with Knock, uh, going back to it, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. And this is important to stress, again, between the API that you're calling and then what you're saying you're mocking. So it's pretty clean in that way. Unmock is for people that write like messy spaghetti code, um, which is me, which is why I made the thing uh, with all of us that made it. Um, but the way that unmock works is you just turn it on. Actually, I have it in do not call unmock mode. That's probably bad. Uh, call unmock for new box. Uh, and it's mad, sorry, TS Lint gets angry when stuff is out of order alphabetically. Okay. So, yeah, let's run that again. So, the way that unmock works is instead of defining um, the mocks that you're going to use, you just call await unmock. So, you see that the biggest difference here is that there's no declarative step where you say, I'm going to call it GitHub, then da 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 da. You just say await uh, unmock. Um, let me actually. Start it one more time because unlock has caching. Let me 
do RMRF and then please let me write the file correctly so I don't erase my hard drive. Uh, I did something almost as bad during one of these presentations once, but luckily I had a backup. Uh, so great. Um, okay, so now without further ado, I can actually show you the thing I want to show you, which is the following: that if we're running this Next.js app, so uh, it's a little app I wrote called Porter Duff, uh, just because I like Porter Duff compositing. So when I click on submit, what's going to happen under the hood is there's this function that says post email to send grid. So you see that it calls Axios post to send grid, right? Then it's going to meander on through my spaghetti code that's like hopelessly entangled in ways that everybody says it shouldn't be. Then eventually hit Behance. And then there's promise.all and there's a map where it gets comments for a bunch of projects, and that map has like, I don't know, as many projects as it returns. So like, it could be, I don't know, between like five and 10. So no nice interfaces, no abstraction of logic, just like super ugly code that like hits one API uh, after the other until it gets over the net. And what Unlock does, <coughs> so now when I click on Submit, and if there's no hideous demo effect, yeah. It just says, hi, we see you've called Behance. We've sent you mock data back. You could edit it here. Hi, yeah. Do you mind increasing the font size? Yes, of course. Or, sorry, the correct response is no, I don't mind. It's not <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, yeah. So here, it's because I'm using a remote. So Unmock is two parts. There's the JavaScript library, and then there's a remote server. Um, you don't have to use the remote server, and it will create an empty shell. But if you use the remote server, then it will create a shell uh, with actual mock data that resembles the real data. So in this case, it resembles Behance. And if I go to it, um, what it's done, there you go. So it's like if you call the Behance API, it would return something that looks kind of like this, basically. Um, the way that Unlock does that, which is kind of out of the scope of this meetup, th that's the Unlock server part, which has nothing to do with Node.js. It's actually written in Scala. And it uses like web scraping and machine learning to um, create fake versions of APIs. Um, but uh, well, that's that's kind of fun too. But for the purpose of this meetup, uh, the important bit is that once it fetches those, it fills in all the data. And then now, if I look at the cache that I just deleted, which should be recreated, so you see unmock save. And then all those mocks are in there, right? They've been automatically created. So again, I've nowhere declaratively said, I'm going to call Behance here in this way. It's just that it finds that we called it. And then if I want to do like less unmock save bab, that looks nice. And then request that JSON. There you go. It just says all the stuff that's been called. Um, which means that if you change, um, I don't know, uh, let's do something totally um, silly for a second, um, and uh, let's also, just for kicks, call this. So here, yeah, usually you're not supposed to do live coding during a meetup, but life is short. So let's, uh, so here, I just put in another API call into my function. It's not doing anything. But you can see, and this is just like a random project ID. So you see, again, um, it's not like knock where I specified, oh, I should create mock data of it. It's going to run through the program again. And as soon as it does, it will create a mock for it when it hits it. So let's show that just to make sure that I'm double the ways. What is it? You have two awaits there. Uh, I have two awaits. Oh yeah, that's way too much awaiting. Yeah. Awaiting for Godot. So uh, this, yeah, that went through. Thank you for catching that. So now if I do the same exact thing, um, I could reload this. By the way, the, the screen, the way that it looks, um, it's just because this is the way that I consume the mock data. So it's like it generates something fake called maximize and I display it on the screen. But if we go here to this um, silly mock that I created, 4242, you can see now that it's just automatically found it at the end because that's where we put it and it's created a hash for that. And then you can just use the CLI to open the hash. So if I open this, 
I could do uh, yarn unmock open bam and it will uh, sorry I need to use the hash and then it will just open up all that stuff in Vi and I, then I can just edit it so this is my mock right um, and then uh, if it edits if you create something new, then you can open it up and check out something new. The other nice thing is, of course, it gets really sloppy really quick, right? Because you could lose track of all the API calls that are being done. So you could just use the CLI. Sorry. Um, so if I just list from the CLI. Ah, uh, oh yeah, it's not creating any snapshots. That's why. Um, if it were creating snapshots... Yeah, there's no snapshots here. Let me go to a directory where that is. Unmock. NPM run unmock. List. Yeah, so this lists all, that's why, because the snapshots are only made with tests. So this lists the tests, the name of the test, and the hash that corresponds to that. And um, so that's an important thing to say. When I was making that web page, I was only consuming data in order to make a web page. But of course, unmock can also be used for tests just like knock is. Um, that's kind of the um, simplest usage is just to use it in a continuous integration server. Um, so like, for example, um, let's try to find, this is the open source project that I was talking about. Um, here, in a test, you just, before each test, you require unmock. And again, you see that we're not saying the URL we're gonna call because unmock just automatically figures it out. Sorry, it's underlining all this stuff because I've screwed up my TSLint variables, uh, which I need to do, like figure out a certain point. But then it will just uh, automatically create the mocks as you run the tests, and then you can use unmock list. Um, one last thing that I think is pretty cool, at least, is you could just run unmock like curl. How many of you guys know what curl is? Yeah, I mean, you don't, the node SDK runs, works like that. So uh, actually, let's just use curl first. If I use curl to call the Behance API uh, net, v2 projects, right? It will tell me that there's a, um, I'm not authorized, right? Because I used curl. Um, however, if I do that with unmock, so I just put in front of that uh, npm run unmock, and then keep the curl and all that stuff, um, then it will serve back the fake data. So it's like curl of the fake internet is the best way to put it. And that way you can just like explore how stuff works. Um, so uh, super briefly, uh, I'll talk about um, how, uh, how we do it um, for the time being. So the way that we create uh, the mock data, which is outside the scope of Node, we use Scala for that, is that we do like <coughs> web scraping of a lot of public API documentation. We record a lot of API responses, soul crushing manual labor of like curating the mocks, which actually takes like an embarrassingly large amount of time. Um, and then the most fun part is machine learning. So kind of the way that we're able to generate a lot of different mocks on the fly is using, um, uh, using ML to uh, uh, change the parameters in real time. And to show you what that means, because I know that ML is kind of a buzzword and I'm guilty of using it as such, but um, if we go back to this page here, um, crap. So now if I could say um, mode always call unmock, and then I put unmock on random mode. So Memorize the way this screen looks for a second, right? There's like transitional maximize and a bunch of other stuff. Um, if I put it on random mode all the time, then it will um, Let's see actually Yeah, sorry I just need to get the key Slightly anticlimactic, sorry. At all. Uh, it doesn't. Well, reveal key. Alright. Uh, so, unmock token equals yoink and then yarn dev. So, if we run uh, the same exact thing that we just ran in random mode, I'll keep this open so you could see kind of how it looks. Um, 
if you're a designer, this kind of helps you design, like just populate Node.js with data that um, that you can kind of test on the fly every single time. So I think it'll work. I haven't like checked this in, in forever. Maybe not. Yeah, I take it back. Oh, it did work. Okay, so now it generates like a bunch of different <laughs> random data for Behance. And that way, if you're a designer and you want to see like what different things look like, um, different pictures, different whatever. It's just a nice way to generate a lot of random data. Again, rather now now you can see kind of the advantage of this compared to knock if you have a big project. Like manually mocking thousands of random things is like you know some definition of hell. So it's like it can get really time consuming really quick. So um, that helps when you're developing node projects that have a lot of different API calls. Um, so before I take questions, I'll finish uh, um, really briefly uh, just with a recap. So um, the reason that we mock um, uh, API integrations is so they don't do this to us, which would be bad. Uh, there's many bad ways to do it, like just turning the test off or calling the real APIs, which as you saw when we tried to call Behance for real, we just got an error. That's like the most innocent thing that could happen. Reverse engineering the APIs. So one way around that is to use knock and declaratively state the APIs that you're going to call. Um, the other way around it is um, to be lazy like me and use unmock and then um, just fill in the stuff over time. Um, with that, I'll say kind of like everybody else, um, we're hiring, uh, so don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me uh, if by email mike at mishkin.com. That's the name of the company. If you go to mishkin.com, you can see our main product, which is a machine learning product project. But Unmock um, is kind of our side hustle at Mishkin. Uh, we're really fond of it, and we're kind of developing it. It's, it's our only open source project, so whenever we make a new addition to it, uh, we go on the road and talk about it a little bit um, and then see if people want to contribute. So uh, Unmock-JS is the project. Like I said, pull requests are welcome. If someone makes one during this meetup, I will be like flattered. Um, so uh, please do, um, or at the very least, join spectrum.chat slash unmock to talk about it a little bit. Um, so thanks a lot, and yeah, I'll take any questions.